Um, I figured the next best thing we want to talk about is a little bit more about our impact on uh, medical health, about our contact, about our recontacting effort. And um, to be utterly clear, the person who has done more to this than anybody else is Dan Hertz, who has been pushing us pretty much since day one, saying, you got important information here that happens that matters for the health of people. Do something with it. And so I'm really grateful that you're coming and talking to us about where we are. We also have a... Yeah, that's okay. That, thanks for the invitation. Sorry to always be pushing, but oh, no, 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 you no. do have important information. I have no idea so. how grateful I am. No how grateful I am. <laughs> so I'm, I'm coming to uh, give you a little bit of an update on some of the things we've been doing in severe fluoroprimidine toxicity. So I'll start by just level setting and making sure that everyone understands what we're talking about. And then I'll tell you a few of the projects that we're doing, trying to push this into actual clinical practice. So there are two fluoroprimidine chemotherapy agents. One is an IV drug right here that is given systemically. The other is an oral prodrug, capecitabine. And these two drugs are used in a lot of solid tumors. So they are standard first line treatment of colorectal cancer, also used in breast, esophageal, pancreatic, several other tumor types. As with all cancer drugs, they have very severe toxicities that are associated with them. In this case, neutropenia, GI toxicity, mucositis. And these can actually be life-threatening or fatal toxicities. So it's really important that we figure out who is at risk for these toxicities and try to do something to avoid them. So there's a complex metabolic process over here for the effectiveness of these drugs that I won't go into. The important part is that most of the drug that's administered, that's available systemically, about 80% of it, is actually metabolized through this one enzyme, dihydropyrimidine dehydrogenase. The enzyme is DPD, the gene is DPYD, sort of use them interchangeably. But importantly, there are recurrent mutations or variants in this enzyme or in this gene that cause reduced activity or null activity. So there's several different ways you refer to them. I'll usually use these uh, monikers. But you can see each of them is actually relatively infrequent. So uh, less than 1% of the patients carry an individual variant. But on the whole, the population carrying frequency is about 6% of patients. And if you carry these variants and you receive standard dose of these drugs, you have dramatically increased rates of toxicity, and you're from a 60% increase to like a four-fold increase of severe toxicity from these agents. There are also very well-known, highly publicized incidences of fatal toxicity from patients who were not tested, who received this treatment, or were later found out to be carriers. So this is Kathy Servernot, I work with her husband on an advocacy effort to try to get more people to test for this prior to treatment. It's actually standard of care in some parts of the world, but not in the US. So in Europe, they test patients before they start treatment. In the US, for whatever reason, for lots of reasons, I'll tell you all about it. We do not have this as standard of care. The FDA says that you should talk to patients about this. That's a sort of recent update to the package insert but the NCCM ASCO guidelines do not say that this is recommended. In our survey a few years ago, less than 5% of medical oncologists are actually testing their patients prior to treatment, which we're very uh, frustrated by. So if you do test patients, and if you do find out that they are variant carriers, we have <coughs> guidelines from CPEC, it's a very well-known pharmacogenetics organization, that tell you how you should treat patients. This is a sort of oversimplification of their guidelines. Basically, if you have a patient who's wild type, you give them standard doses. If they carry a single variant, you reduce their dose by 50%, and then you uh, escalate their dose as tolerated. If you have a patient who's a poor metabolizer, they're relatively infrequent, but you should avoid the use of these drugs or dramatically decrease their dose. Okay, so getting into the, some of the studies that we have done in MGI, um, as Brett and others have said, we have more than 80,000 patients with known genotypes that we can do retrospective uh, pharmacogenetic associations with. So we did a pretty simple study where we found all the patients in MGI who had received a fluoroprimidine treatment. We found 39 variant carriers of DPYD and 543 wild type patients. We uh, categorized all their information in terms of who they were and what treatment they got. And our primary outcome was grade three or higher toxicity. So in the cancer world, this is a severe toxicity. And we found, as others have shown, that there is a dramatic increase in the risk of severe toxicity or treatment adjustment due to toxicity. 
you can see the odds ratios of either doubling or tripling of risk. And these are fine. We can do these studies as a retrospective. They're easy. They're free because of MGI that you have so much. But if anyone has an idea, if you don't do pharmacogenetics research, but you have an idea for a drug and some toxicity, we can do these studies all day, every day with the student for free relatively quickly. Please contact us. We have plenty of people in the College of Pharmacy. We have experts in basically every field of treatment. So we'll send you up with something. We can do these studies. That's fine. That's retrospective association studies. They're great. It's important information. What we really want to do is figure out how can we actually use this information to enhance patient care. So again, we have all these patients. This information cannot be used directly for clinical decision making because it is not CLIA approved. But we do have the uh, approval to recontact these patients, as we discussed previously, and recontact them for additional research studies. So everything that we've done has been set up as a research study, but this is really sort of clinical implementation. So here was our first attempt at doing this. Again, we have our NDI participants. We know who those carriers are of these five validated DPYD variants. We had about 3,000 of them. So we thought, we know who these patients are. They are at very high risk of very severe toxicity. We should be monitoring these patients. So we set up an alert in the <coughs> chart. If any of these patients are diagnosed with a tumor type that is likely to be treated with fluoroprimidine or actually is ordered a fluoroprimidine, our study team gets an immediate alert. We review this patient's profile, make sure that they are eligible for our study, make sure they haven't received a fluoroprimidine before, and make sure that they should be contacted. If they uh, agree to enroll and be part of the study, we send them for confirmatory genotyping. So again, our genetic data in the MGI is not CLIA approved, so it can't be used for medical decision making, but we get a sample from them, we enroll them, we send them for confirmatory clinical sequencing or genotyping, excuse me. And then <clears throat> if we confirm their genotype, which in every case we have confirmed their genotype is correct, we tell the medical oncologist, do not move forward with the treatment plan. It's very dangerous for this patient. You should instead follow the CPIC guidelines, reduce the dose, or change your treatment. So this was probably the most exciting thing that's happened in my research career. We got an alert basically as soon as we set this up, I think one or two days later, we got an alert that there was a patient who was recently diagnosed with colorectal cancer, who MGI said was a carrier of DPY variant. We actually contacted the medical oncologist and they told us that they hadn't seen this patient yet, but they were very excited to hear this. So they said, give us a couple days. They met with the patient and agreed that they were gonna go forward for a need treatment and then we should try to enroll them on the study. So we contacted the patient the next day. I actually made this all myself. It was very exciting. I told this patient, I, I will say for the, the question about recontacting patients, Sometimes they remember being an MGI. A lot of times they have no idea what you're talking about. So when you call them and you're like, we know your genetics and we need you for a study. They're like, what? But this patient was very, very excited because we explained to them, you're at high risk of very severe toxicity. Enroll in our study. We'll set you up and make sure that that doesn't happen. So they enrolled the next day. A few days later, we had their confirmatory genotyping. It agreed with MGI as it always does and we moved forward with a reduced dose of the treatment to make sure this patient didn't have very severe toxicity. So we have had this study ongoing for DPYD for maybe about four years. So we essentially are passively monitoring about 3,000 patients at high risk of toxicity. Every now and then we get an alert, we intervene, make sure these patients don't go forward with either treatment that's very risky. We then got a Precision Health Award. My colleague, Amy Pasternak, was the PI of this um, proposal. And we expanded this beyond DPYD to another gene, UGT-101, that's, uh, <clears throat> that, that predicts risk of another um, chemotherapy agent, a reno -TCAN, that is often used in combination with means. So in the year, we've had uh, about 100 alerts for different patients that were going to receive either fluoroprimidines or arenotecan that were in MGI and were at risk. So we are monitoring these patients to make sure this doesn't happen. And we have a strategy, we've figured out how to do this, we've worked with the IRB, we've worked with MGI, we've worked with Janet, we've worked with everybody necessary to make sure that we can actually use MGI data 
to intervene in patients who have high risk of some toxicity or whatever outcome from clinical treatment. So now that we have this process, we're trying to figure out how else can we expand this. So that's where we are today. We're working with Tony and lots of other people to try to figure out how do we expand this to other treatment settings where we have actionable pharmacogenetic information. So in MGI, uh, someone mentioned maybe past next recent publication, there are more than 50 medications that have pharmacogenetics dosing guidelines from CPIC and other organizations. We know who the patients are that are carrying these variants. We know what the relevant drugs are. We just have to work together to make sure that we set up the alerts and have a study team in place and work with the clinicians to let them know we have this information and this patient should be switched or avoided or dose reduced or whatever it is. So we have identified a couple of use cases that we think we'll start with. So 619 citalopram, med 15 thiopurines, HLA variants, which are uh, somewhat uncommon, but are very high risk for very severe uh, idiosyncratic toxicities and uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome and, and other really severe toxicities in patients who have them. So these are the use cases that we are planning to move forward with based on our discussions, our expertise, and the interest in the clinicians, but if you are a clinician, if you're working in some disease state and there's something actionable that you want to work on, contact us and we are happy to work with everybody to make sure that people are using this MGI data to make uh, treatment recommendations that are uh, benefit the patients. So we have submitted this to the IRB. It's sort of an expansion of our same process where we know that we have a patient in MGI who has some kind of actionable genotype and is expected to receive the relevant drug. We then contact the patient and they consent to share this information with their treating provider. Once they consent to that, we then tell the provider about this information and then we're just monitoring to see if the provider actually sends them for confirmatory genotyping. In the way this IRB is set up, we think it'll be um, acceptable to do this. This is not sort of clinical decision making. This is just sharing information and we want to see whether and how clinicians are using this information. We think that downstream, this will benefit patients, but we are not actually collecting that. We are just helping clinicians make decisions for their patients. I want to thank you all for your attention. I want to thank everybody who's helped out with this, particularly Amy Pasternak, who's been working with me on these projects and leading some of them. Um, our collaborators in the Royal Cancer Center and the School of Public Health in particular, and everyone from Precision Health. So thank you guys very much. Thank <laughs> you.